It's an honor for me to be here at UVU today. I tell you, I, I'm very impressed with UVU. We have uh, a number, about 500, I believe, UVU students who work at doTERRA today. And uh, we have a great relationship with the university. And it starts with uh, President Holland and Paige. Uh, Paige Holland's a dear friend of my wife's. Um, and they play tennis together. They were skiing a couple weeks ago together. They have a, a good time. And, and we're, I'm just so impressed with what's happening at UVU, the quality of education and things that are happening. And so it's an honor for me to be here today. I was asked to speak for just <clears throat> a couple of minutes <clears throat> about, I just want to explain a little bit about doTERRA. It won't take much. This isn't a doTERRA pitch. But then I want to talk about uh, some things that uh, I think will help you in your careers, at least uh, if you want to listen to ideas from a 50-plus something-year-old man about what to do in life. And I know sometimes with my kids, they think I'm too old to understand. And then the older they get, they realize, oh, Dad really did know something about things. So anyway, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be helpful. So let me tell you quickly about doTERRA. doTERRA was founded in, in 2008. It's a privately held company. We're the world's largest essential oil company. We, we have uh, about 2,500, actually pushing close to 3,000 employees around the world now with uh, about 2,400 of them in, in Utah. We have over 5 million uh, customers, and, and we're continuing to grow. We're doubling the size of our campus right now. We're going from um, just about 500,000 square feet of space to, to just under a million, and actually I was reviewing plans this morning that will take us well over a million. So we continue to grow and expand, and, uh, and we're growing um, internationally as well. It's very exciting to see what's happening internationally. <clears throat> International, the global business, accounts for about 40% of our business today, um, but it, it's growing very rapidly. We, we sell essential oils. We're an essential oil company. Essential oils are aromatic compounds from plants. They're really unique. They're very powerful, um, and uh, they have great uh, benefits to us, both uh, physically and emotionally and the, uh, in health benefits. We're doing a lot in the healthcare world now, and we're really excited about, about what's happening with essential oils. There's a big focus in the world of returning to nature, uh, things that are pure and natural, and that's a, a big part of what our focus is with essential oils. We source these from, oh, I went forward too much. We source these from about 46 countries around the world. And so uh, that's a, a big part of the work. I'll mention this a little bit later, but something that really is motivating to me, the work that we're doing globally uh, all over the world uh, as we source essential oils. Um, and we do have essential oils to account for about 60 to 70 percent of our business, but we do have some personal care products and nutritional products to kind of round out our offering. Most of those products include essential oils in them. It's you go to a grocery store today or a department store and you'll see a lot of products now include essential oils in them um, because of the fragrance and because of the, the health benefits associated with them. So let me tell you, uh, Tom mentioned some of my background. It starts with me from growing up on a farm in Smithfield, Utah. I don't know if you know where Smithfield is. It's, it's way up north by the Idaho border and uh, up in Cache Valley and it was a great place to grow up. I, my father was a uh, taught at a high school, um, was a coach, uh, was a principal at a middle school, and uh, farmed on the side. And I grew up spending my summers uh, working from 5 a.m. in the morning until late in the afternoon, hauling hay, moving pipe, and doing all those fun things. So it was a, it was a great growing up experience. I then went to college, went to BYU. I graduated from BYU. I also, um, as Tom mentioned, have a degree, an MBA from Utah State, uh, which was a good experience. I, I worked for Deloitte & Touche in public accounting, which was another great experience. Did that for almost three years, and then I went to New Skin when New Skin was really quite small. And I was involved with a lot of different things at New Skin over the years. Um, I was their CFO for a, a period of time. I was uh, president of our Greater China business. I was an executive vice president, did a number of different things, including being very involved in in Nuskin's public offering, and, and that was something that was a lot of work, but it was a very fulfilling period of time to work with Wall Street. Um, it's made me realize that I, I don't want to ever do that again, but it was good for the time and, and, and was a great growing experience. 
I then served as a, as a mission president in Melbourne, Australia, as was mentioned, and just following that, I, I went to doTERRA shortly after doTERRA was founded. doTERRA was founded by some of my former colleagues um, when I was at NewScan, and um, they actually visited with me in Australia um, and talked to me about coming and working for doTERRA, and it was this tiny little company, and I really thought, um, this is kind of a boutique thing, and maybe it will grow a little bit. I thought it would kind of be a part-time deal, um, but it, it's turned into huge. It's really, we're really growing and expanding all over the world, and so it's been a, a great experience for the last seven years. I want to mention um, some advice I have that anytime I interview someone, um, or I talk to my teams about interviewing someone, I, I tell them when they look for a new employee, I like to look for three things. Three things that I think are the most important things in, in an employee and, and what's valuable about an employee. First is I want to make sure that they're smart, they're competent, they have the intellect to be able to perform well. I want to make sure that they're, they're going to have a passion for what they're doing. And I want to make sure that they can get along with other people and work in a team environment. These three things become the heart and soul. And as I evaluate all of the employees that I work with, I evaluate them based on these three things. Do they have the competence to do the job that we're asking them to do? Or do we need to provide some more training and help and support for them? Do they have the passion? Are they committed? Are they working hard? Are they giving the effort that's needed? And do they work well with other teams? And, and you, it's hard to find people who have all three uh, working at the optimal level. Often what you have is people who rely on one of these things and not the others. For example, I use these examples, okay? If someone is just, um, you know, a relationship-focused person, you think of them as like a, a teacher's pet, someone who's just hanging out, trying to be friends with everybody, but never really gets anything done. And we have those sorts of people in the company, and it's a bit of a challenge. I used to work with one of these at another company, and someone like this, who was, who was good, who could do things, but spent their life, our CEO used to say he spent his life pollinating flowers. He just ran around, talked to different people, but, but never really got the real work done. You have people who are passionate. They work really, really hard. They're like eager beavers. They're just, they're wanting to do everything, but they just don't have the skill set or they don't get along with others well, and, and they're not able to really perform at, at their top capacity. And then you have people who are really, really smart, and they just rely on that, and they're viewed as very brainy. You know, you, you think of the person in the, in the glasses that's sitting back in their office and just doesn't relate with other people, and that's fine, but they have a hard time really contributing to the success of the company. And then if you think about this, if we're weighted to one area or another, or we maybe take in two of these areas, you end up with a, a little bit of a different environment. You end up, if you're, if you're intellectual and you, you relate well with people, but you don't work hard, then you get a perception of being privileged. And, and that's not something that you want to have. Someone who's, who's smart, who gets along with people, but they're not working really hard, they're going to have a hard time being a great contributor to the company. If, if you have someone who's, who's passionate, they work really hard and they get along well with people, but their training, their intellect is not where it needs to be, then they're kind of simplistic and they're not going to be put on the best top projects in the company and, and given the best assignments because you just don't think they have the horsepower to be able to accomplish things. At the bottom, you have people, this may be the worst one, and, and I, I will confess that some of my career, this is probably where I ended up, where, you know, you, you can do it, intellectually you can do it, you're passionate, you work really hard, but if you're not focused on getting along with other people, then you get a perception of being arrogant, and it makes it difficult. And, and you need to be able to get along well with other people. You need to relate well with other people. I'll tell you a quick story about that, and this is... This is for me, it's something that I have worked on my whole career and I continue to work on, is making sure that I'm relating well with all the different groups of the company and everyone around me. And I, I consider their needs and not just my own needs. I, I have a quick story about this. When I was young in my career, I was uh, 32 years old. I was the CFO of a 
listed New York Stock Exchange company, a consumer products company. I was one of the youngest CFOs on Wall Street, and I would go to conferences, and people would talk to me about what it was like being this young CFO, because for consumer companies, a lot of times the CFO, not tech companies, it's a different world in tech, but in, in consumer companies, CFOs are often 50, 60 years old, and I was this 32-year-old person. And I remember that I had a, a CEO who's actually on the board of regents and helping to select a new president for UVU, Steve Lund, a great man who gave me some advice. And, and his advice was, look, I was strong. I knew what I was doing. I had the competence to do the work. I worked very hard. No one worked harder than I did at getting things done. But I needed to build relationships with others. And he told me one day, he said, you go into a meeting, and within five minutes, you've already, you already know what the right answer needs to be. And everyone watches you. And they look and see how you respond. And if you roll your eyes or you, you know, give a funny look, everyone knows that this meeting's over and you've just kind of destroyed the relationship of what happens. And you need to help people come to their own decision in that regard. <clears throat> and I remember thinking about that and I thought, well, I'm too busy. I got too much time. I don't have time for all this, right? And I was accomplishing a lot, doing a lot of things, but I, I've really reflected on that a lot. Anyway, I came home. I remember the exact same day that I had that conversation with our CEO, uh, good friend Steve Lund, and that advice he gave me. I came home and I, I was with my wife, and my wife said, oh, we had a problem at school today, uh, at the school today, and I talked to one of the teachers. He, she was at a parent-teacher's conference, and she said, I have this, our son, our oldest son, who may be here somewhere, I don't know, but he said he was in third grade, and the teacher said, the problem is he's, He's very smart. He knows all the right answers. But when someone in the class gives the wrong answer, he laughs at them, OK? Or he rolls his eyes. And I thought, oh my goodness, OK? That's exactly what the CEO had just mentioned to me that I needed to work on. And I remember telling my wife, wow, this is a, this is a, a point. I really need to understand this, because my reactions were coming up in my children. And, and I, I can tell you, I've worked on this my whole career. I've worked on it so that I can have good relationships, so I can work with departments throughout the company and, and other professionals and, and respect what they do and work together collaboratively. If, if you work on, if you have an intellect and if you have a passion and you have a good relationships with others, if you can do that, then you get what I believe is a key strategic contributor to the company. And, and that's what you all want to be. You want to be a key strategic contributor. So I would just encourage you to make sure that you're well-trained and you have the intellect to be able to do your job, that you're passionate about it, and that you work well with others. And when you do those three things, you can accomplish anything. And uh, I think that's the key, the key to success. Now, I want to mention a few other thoughts that I have about about succeeding in the world and, and how the world works today and, and some tips maybe as you think about the future. The first thing I want to mention is that it's important to be patient and to pay your dues. I, I talked to people. I had a, uh, uh, the nephew of my wife who is a great young man and he, he he lived in a home we had, and he was there, and he lived with his wife, and they had a kid, and, and he, he would come to Sunday dinner at our home, and I'm like, Nate, what, what's your career ambition? You know, what do you want to accomplish? And he's like, I want to be the CEO of a company. I want to run a, run a business. And I'm like, okay, great. How are you going to do that? And he said, he said well, right now I'm I'm working on writing a book about bartering, right? And he was working on bartering. He actually was really good at it, but he was writing this book on bartering. And he was working as a, as a waiter in a restaurant. And he did this for almost an entire year. He's working as a waiter. He graduated from school. He had a degree. And his wife came to me one time and said, will you talk to Nate? OK, he needs to get a real job, right? We need to go forward and pay your dues. He's not going to be the CEO if he's, you know, his career aspirations if he doesn't pay his dues. And I talked with Nate and I encouraged him and he actually came to work with us at, at doTERRA 
And because I just said, you just got to work in a corporate environment, pay your dues. And, and he has great skills. And he worked, he started in our call center. And then he, and he moved up because he was setting records in the call center. He moved up into our account management function. And, and then we actually moved him to Japan. And he became an expatriate for us in Japan. And he moved from from account management function to the IT world. And he's a relationship guy in, in our IT world. And then we moved him, and he's now an expatriate with his family in Melbourne, Australia, having a great experience. And he's on a path to accomplish great things. But you got to pay your dues. And you have to learn from mistakes. Sometimes we make mistakes. And whatever mistakes we make, we learn from. This is a picture. Um, many years ago, my wife and I, I don't know if you've heard of Dream Dinners, but it's a great franchise. Um, they have one in Orem. I highly recommend it. But we started a franchise, my wife and I. We went out and we decided to own a franchise back in Cache Valley where I was from. And we went and got this real estate. And we signed a lease. Tom's been in the real estate world. This was back in the time when it was booming. And we needed to sign a five-year lease, right? That's what, that's what was, was required. And we signed this lease, and we started this business. And, and people loved it um, up in Cache Valley. It's a smaller community than Utah County. And we just couldn't quite get enough traffic. But those that came loved it. And, and we employed my brother-in-law, and he did a great job. And everyone was happy except me, because at the end of every month, we were a couple thousand dollars short of breaking even. Okay? This went on for two years. And finally, I said, I just, you know, we just can't keep doing this, right? It's got to change. And I went to the company and tried to negotiate with Dream Dinners to say, this has got to be different. And they said, no, 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 that's the way we work. And so we closed the business. And, and but <laughs> I had a five-year lease. So I thought, I'll just sublease it. My lease was $3,000 a month. And now the economies had crashed. And... Uh, I had to sublease it. it. I went for a year without finding anyone to sublease it. And finally, the last year, someone subleased it, and they paid me $1,000 a month, right, towards my $3,000 payment. But I learned from that experience. And, and I view it as a valuable part of my ultimate success in life, whatever success I've achieved, is because I've had some failures. And we have failures, and we need to learn from our failures. The second thing is you need to find your passion. You know, you don't find your passion without paying your dues, but while you're paying your dues, you need to find your passion, something that you can be really passionate about and really love to do because your work career is a big part of your life and you want to be passionate about it. When I grew up, when I was young, my passion was sports. This is a picture of my father who just passed away a few years ago. This is when they won the Grey Cup, uh, which is the Super Bowl of Canada. He played professional football. He played, he was All-American in college. He went on and he played uh, in the Canadian Football League back in the 50s, and they won the Grey Cup. And there's my dad and my mom. This is me. I grew up being a quarterback. I was, I wanted, my passion, this is when I was at, at BYU. I didn't really ever play, but I was on the team. I actually had a neck back then. It's amazing, different, and hair. It was crazy. Anyway, um, but I, I wanted, my passion at the time, I thought was, Look, my ideal job would be to be like the general manager of the Utah Jazz. That way I'm paid to go to a basketball game, or, and that's what I want to do, right? Well, I realized that wasn't really working out or not really a great career for me. But what I have found and what I'm passionate about today is this is a picture of the farm I grew up on. This is my father and the farm and the tractor he has and, and where I grew up on a farm. And, and I grew up with farming, and I have a passion for it. I don't farm a lot today, I have a garden, different things, but now in doTERRA, I love going out and working with our farmers all over the world, right? This is a picture in Kenya that was just a few months ago with this woman named Rebecca who has a family of six children, and she's trying to provide for her family. Her husband works some, but she provides, and she farms about half an acre of farmland that she is farming on. And, and she's been growing corn and watermelons, of all things. And watermelons make a little bit more money, but you're subject to the vagaries of climate. And, and so it's a difficult thing. It was difficult for her 
through our cooperative and what we built in Kenya through doTERRA, we now have got her growing ginger. And this is her ginger crop. It's beautiful, fresh ginger. And she now can make over five times as much money in a year by farming ginger for us than she could by farming corn and watermelons. And, and what we've been able to do is this land that she farms, we'd have her grow some other things like eucalyptus and other things, but she, her, her family don't actually own that land. They're what are called squatters. They just have gone in and started farming this land. But we have a program that we have developed, that I've developed with our team, that says that if she can grow ginger for us for a few years, she'll make enough, and we'll be able to help her get her own plot of land so that she can have land ownership, she can own it, and she can pass it on to her children, and they can farm ginger for us for decades to come. And I can get really passionate about that because I grew up on a farm. And so that's one of the things that really drives me today and, and what I love about what I do is because we're able to help farmers, which goes back to my roots. So I just encourage you to find something where you can have passion. This is a, a painting that I had commissioned of, of in Nepal. I've been to Nepal multiple times and beautiful place. If you look clear in the back, that's Mount Everest and I took a helicopter up around Mount Everest and it was beautiful, a great experience up over base camp. And, any of you ever want to do that, my hat's off to you. It's a great experience, but taking a helicopter was a lot easier, okay? <laughs> but but these, are, these are people in Nepal that harvest wintergreen for us, and, and this painting is, is reminiscent of that, and it sits in my office, this big painting, so that it reminds me of, of we sell products, we do a lot of things every day, but ultimately it's these families that are impacted that, that we're helping provide a better way of life for. And I can tell you, I get very passionate about it. The third thing is to have integrity, to cling to integrity, and make sure that integrity is a key part of what you're doing. I, I, I can't tell you how important that is in multiple ways. There's a, you know, I'm a believer that, that, that Sundays are a day we have to be careful with. And when I was in China running a business, we would close our stores on Sunday, and, and the government would come and say, why are you doing that? The media, why are you closing your stores on Sunday? And I would say, because we believe that everyone needs it one day a week to be with their families. And for us, it's Sunday. And, and we stayed to that. And we were very successful, and closing our stores on Sunday did not impact our business negatively at all. In fact, I believe firmly that it enhanced our business. It, having integrity also means that you're loyal to people who have helped you be successful. Here's a picture of some of our very top sales leaders in doTERRA, people who are selling our products. And I can tell you that as we make decisions in the company, it's not about what's going to bring us the most profit, what's going to bring us the most revenue. Because we could, today in doTERRA, we have a pretty big brand name across the United States and growing across the world. And, and we could, in theory, bypass our distributors and go retail. And sometimes that discussion comes up. And I can tell you that we're 100% committed to stay loyal to these people who have built the business with us. And, and that's an essential thing, is to have whatever it is to have integrity and not sell people out for a few dollars or some other way of doing the business. You got to make sure that you're loyal to people and taking care of people. The next thing quickly is as you develop in your career, you've got to focus on developing others. One of the hallmarks for me, I feel like, in my career is that I have hired some amazing people. They are so good. And I love the people who've worked for me. And I have a great loyalty with them. And, and they're, they're very good at what they do. I'm always troubled when a manager says that the people who work for them are not performing well or not doing well or something needs to change and I just don't have good people. When that happens, I believe that that's a reflection on them as a manager, right? Because when you're blaming other people, it's a reflection on you as a manager. And so you want to make sure that you're always developing other people. You want to make sure that, you're, it's a, you know, that they're succeeding in life. Um, oops, let me go back. 
you know, you need to be humble with whatever success you've had. And I believe that you want to accept responsibility and deflect praise, right? Deflect the praise. Let others receive the praise. And you just accept the responsibility to make sure things get done. And when you do that and you're developing others, you can have amazingly strong teams that, that can accomplish great things. Um, you know, at doTERRA, we're in a mode now where we're receiving lots of awards, lots of recognition for our growth. I, you know, probably the one Forbes recognized this a few years ago, and again last year, is one of the best mid-sized employers in all of America. We were the number two mid-sized company, which are companies from about, you know, a billion to five billion in sales, and, and we were the best, second best mid-sized employer of all of America. And and that's, that's not something we even sought for. We didn't apply for this. This is just they had done a survey and, and recognized us for that. It's not, that's not because of me. That's because of our great employees and our sales force. And you need to recognize how success really comes and not become proud when success happens. Finally, you need to always remember that relationships matter. And you don't want to burn bridges as you move on in your career. An example of this is that here's a picture. Oh, this is, uh, don't burn bridges. Here's a picture. This is a picture that was taken this fall. We had a dinner. We had um, a dinner with about 100 people from, well, I think there were 90 people from our overseas offices who were in town. And so, with doTERRA. So they were coming from Japan and from China, from Europe, from all different places. And we took this picture of about 25 of us who all worked at New Skin together, okay? And, and many of them had left New Skin and done other things, but then they come back, and now we're working together. That e even for my career, I was at New Skin, I left to be a mission president, and then it was some of my former New Skin colleagues who we got together early on in doTERRA. In doTERRA today, five of the seven founders of doTERRA were from New Skin. So I can tell you that Things come around, things change, but relationships stay. And so you want to always have positive relationships. And it's an honor for me to work with all these great people who I've worked with for many, many years now in different companies. Finally, you want to make sure that you're focused on family because ultimately in life, those relationships are the most important, I can tell you. This is a picture of my family, okay? And we have all of our grandkids and my kids, and, and I want them to be happy in life. And, and ultimately, I view my success in life through them. And, and are they successful? Are they moving forward? And are they contributing to the world in positive ways? As we think about all of this, it's important to remember that we count success primarily in our relationships. Always remember that. If we work hard, if we get the training we need, we have great relationships, and we're passionate about what we do, we're going to develop positive relationships that are going to last with us throughout this life. And, and that's what ultim ultimate success is. So that's my message to you today. I, did, I was told there's some questions and answers, and I will tell you, yes, I did vote for Tom McDonald. Okay, so... <laughs> What other questions do you have? Happy to answer questions for a few minutes. That's all, that's all the important ones right there. <laughs> okay. Can I ask, how many of you work at doTERRA? Does anyone here work for doTERRA? Okay, a couple people. Great, just a few. Oh, by the way, there is a booth outside. There is one? Okay. Uh, if you're interested in employment opportunities, there's a booth. I can tell you, I'm not here to hire, but we do have, over the next three or four years, we are going to hire about 1,000 people in all kinds of different disciplines. So there's lots of opportunities if you're, if you're interested. But anyway, what other questions do you have? Yes, on the back. One of the questions, obviously, is um, obviously you're very wealthy. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, what is the role, Well, thank you for that, for that question. I'm not really that wealthy, but it's degrees of wealth, I presume. 
comparison to people in the world, we're all very wealthy, that's for sure. So, you know, I think, I think the issue is that you need to always stay grounded, right? And, and for me, I will tell you, I will give great credit to my amazing wife who sits on the board of the UVU Success, uh, Women's Success Center, and, and she's amazing. And there are times in my career where I was so busy at work and I was traveling. I will tell you, uh, at one point, about 10 or 12 years ago, I was traveling a lot. And, and as you travel, as you work uh, overseas, the tax guys make you keep track of how many days you spend in each country and where you're at. This is a tax issue, but I won't get into tax, right? So, yeah, you get into all this tax, so you have to keep track. So for years, I've kept track of how many days. And I got up to, we had our, our eighth child, and I was traveling about a, 130 days a year. I was out of the country, right? And, and my wife corrected me, and she said, this does not work. Okay, you are gone too much. And I'm like, well, how do I do this? I, I got all this stuff, I'm trying my best. But I had to make some corrections. At the time, I was both the CFO and the COO at Newskin, and I went to the CEO and I said, I can't do this, okay? I have to just focus on one area because I've got too much to do. And I, I had to make a correction and had to focus back on my family. And I found that if I would travel 70 or 80 days a year that there was a balance that would work. But my wife's amazing. For some families, that would not work. And, and if you focus on your family as being the most important thing in your life, that helps. I'll tell you one other thing, and my, my family knows this, uh, but I, you know, you have to realize that your family is, is more important than anything else. And and you want to help and serve your family. And so something I have done for many, many years, my oldest daughters, as you see, my three oldest daughters, three oldest children are daughters, and they're beautiful, and they would go to school in the morning, and they had to have their hair done, right? And it seemed like we were just always so rushed in the morning to get them ready for school. And I, so I told my wife many, many years ago, I said, how can I help, right? And she said, well, you could do their hair. And I said, that's not going to happen, okay? Because my fingers just don't do that. I said, so how about if I fix breakfast? I will fix breakfast. And so for the past 18 or 20 years, I fix breakfast every morning for my family, right? And, and it's during that time that I realized that I'm, when I'm in town, okay, there's times I'm not in town, right? But when I'm in town, I fix breakfast. And, and it, it helps me stay grounded. It helps me realize that I'm serving my family. And what's happening in the life of my kids are more important for them than what I've got going on at work that day. So, I don't know, find ways to continue to serve your family. Um, President now, Russell M. Nelson, but he, he was a very successful man. He was a surgeon. He was a, a church, was involved in his church. And he had ten children, nine daughters and then a son. <laughs> Poor man. Um, <laughs> sorry. I actually met with him once and, and I said, he said, what advice? He said, what, do you have any questions? And I, I said, I said, I just have some advice. How do you raise teenage daughters, right? You had nine, okay? I just have six. And he said, daughters in their teenage years seem to turn inward and think that the world revolves around them. He said, but don't worry. When they turn 20, they turn outward again. It's the most beautiful thing ever, right? And I have found that is true, right? I love my daughters. Those teenage years are a challenge. Anyway, um, I don't know where I was, but, but you focus on, on serving others. And what he said once was, you know, the balance of family and service and the community and work is hard. And he said, how do you find balance? And he said, there is no such thing as balance. He said, it's like the... I'm paraphrasing here because this is not very sophisticated. It's like the whack-a-mole game, right? You're like Whatever's out of balance, you've got to focus on and you've got to hit. If your family needs help, then you need to adjust and spend time with your family. So I don't know. I grew up in a great family. I had great parents, and I'm focused on, on helping my family, and I think that helps me stay grounded. Okay, next. Yes? So um, doTERRA and New Skin, those are MLMs. Correct. Correct. Okay, so what have you found? 
found, what is, how have you been able to give your distributors the vision of mm -hmm. what you're selling to really get them um, effectively selling your product? Okay, that's a question about direct selling, network marketing, multi-level marketing. Um, New Skin and, and doTERRA are very different companies. They're kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum. And both great companies. I, I worked for New Skin for a long time. I have tons of respect for them. They are an opportunity company, and they focus on, their leaders focus on the opportunity, and they focus on that vision. And so, and so where they focus, what their vision is, what they focus has got to be the area that you focus on. So we spent a lot of time there focusing on the future, how people could, could make money and how the compensation plan worked and, and how they could succeed, right? doTERRA is very different. doTERRA is a very product-oriented company. Um, we've never joined the Direct Selling Association. We don't do those sorts of things. And so we focus on the vision of, of what our distributors are really selling. So we focus on the product. So, so we intentionally, very rarely, talk about commissions and earnings and those sorts of things. We focus on products because that's what people want. So you have to focus on the need of people. You can't force it down their throat. If I were to go to an, a new skin meeting today and spend all the time talking about products, people would be confused. And they have great products. That's not the point. But their focus is on opportunity, whereas doTERRA's focus is on products. So you have to have a vision of what is it that you can do better than anyone else, you feel like you can do better than anyone else, and you've got to stay true to that and not become something you're not. Well, I, it depends. I mean, it depends on the market. I will tell you this today. In, in the United States, it's much more effective. But in China, where people are wanting to make money, uh, Nuskin's huge, right? Good for them. And we're in China, and we're making our way, and we'll be successful there. But it's a different environment in different areas of the world and what people want, right? OK, other questions? Yes, over here. Hi, so uh, you were the CFO. Correct. Correct. Um, did you have to go through like a personal rebranding, or how did you um, maneuver into that position with such a track record in something other than being the president? Like but, but, oh, it's a good, it's a good question, right? So I was the CFO. Uh, I have been that in my whole career. Um, we we have a CEO still, so the president CEO, and and he and I kind of share responsibility for major areas of the company. Um, I actually have a pretty broad view of what a CFO is and what a CFO can do. And, and it's not only just numbers. I have people who work for me who are very numbers focused. But I think a CFO can be and should be very strategic in what they do. And, and as part of that, um, I oversee the operations side, not only finance, but also operations, which is a big piece, involves all the growing and all that that's happening. And I've also lived overseas, and so I oversee kind of half the world, the global world of, of doTERRA. So it's not a huge shift for me. It's an evolution in my career. I wouldn't have been ready for it 20 years ago. Remember, remember my early chart when I said I was probably a little bit arrogant? That was my strong CFO days. But as I have broadened, I believe, my skill set and, and been able to work with other people, the transition to being functioning in the president role has really not been that difficult for me. I don't think it's, it's been hard. Um, but again, all CFOs are different, okay? And some are very, you know, focused on finances and some are, are more broad rounded. I've had to round out my skill set a little bit, I think, is the answer. Okay, yes, next question. Um, I ate a bag of potato chips every day, so that helps, okay? Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a couple of things, okay, if I have to get to three. Um, but I, one is I, I worked very hard in my classes, okay? You're students here, right? And I would work hard to get the best grade I could, right? And honestly, I found, I found and I love BYU, I love UVU, I love Utah State, I... Maybe don't love the U, but that's a different story, okay? Um, but, but I found that my, my, my schooling at, in my MBA was probably more effective than my schooling in my undergraduate. Because when I was an undergraduate, 
I would study just to take exams. That's all I cared about, right? I would study hard to do my best on this exam, but I didn't know how that skill set related in the world or why it was important. And when I was working and got my MBA later on, then I could see, ah, this is how this comes together. And I, it made more sense. So my point is, study hard. Study hard in your classes because it's a skill set that will stay with you forever. The second thing is, early on, is you've got to develop relationships. You've got to network and talk to people and know what's happening. And I can tell you, even more in today's world than when I was younger, it's, it's, about, it's about relationships. And, you know, when, when we get, we have a job opening, and we may have a really cool job opening, and we'll get 100 resumes for that job, okay? But... There's always one or two that someone knows, someone knows this person, and if there's a connection there, they're going to rise to the top, and those people are for sure going to be interviewed. doesn't mean they'll get the job, but they'll be interviewed, right? And it gives you a leg up because you know someone. And so having relationships. My very first job at Deloitte, I'll tell you this experience quickly. I was, uh, I was at, at BYU. I was in, in accounting, and I never wanted to be an accountant, okay? I just... I got in accounting because I took a class and I thought, oh, this is easy. It was easy for me. Some people accounting is not easy for. For me, it was easy. And so I just stayed in that path, right? But I never, I wanted to go get an MBA. I wanted to do business, right? I, I admired my mission president. I don't want to talk about the church all the time, but I admired my mission president who had been the president of Allstate Insurance. I thought, oh, that's what I want to be, right? I want to do something like this. And, and so I wanted to get an MBA. So I, I applied to MBA schools after my... Um, Oh, just as I was getting to graduate, I didn't apply for the accounting jobs. I applied to go to MBA school and at the big MBA schools. I was accepted by some mid-tier programs, but the top schools all said, ah, oh, you need experience. Go work. You got to work for a couple of years before you apply here. And so I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? I had missed the interview time uh, for these other jobs. So I thought, and then I ended up, anyway, getting married, planning to get married with my wife. Not my wife. We decide. Well, I knew her, but we got engaged and we're going to get married. I'm like, I need to work. I need a job, right? And so I went to apply to, to try to interview these accounting firms. But they'd all interviewed in the fall, and now we're into January, February. And there was one firm in Salt Lake that had an opening, Deloitte, and, of course, where I went and worked. But they had one opening, and there were several people applying for this job. And I made the cut to, to go up and interview with them. And when I walked in to interview with the partner of this, law, of this accounting firm, the first thing he said to me is, oh, I saw your mission president last week. He happens to sit on the board of one of our biggest clients. He gave you a great recommendation, right? <laughs> so I was worried because I knew that some of the people interviewing were higher than me in the class standing and, you know, very smart kids. And, but I got the job. And I really believe I got the job because of my relationship with my mission president, right? Relationships matter, right? So I would establish great relationships and try, try to network. Study hard, um, great relationships, and, and set some goals today at a young age of what you want to accomplish. One thing I would do if I were you is I would set goals to say, when do I want to retire and what do I want to do in retirement, okay? And you set those today. And you work towards those and keep them with you. Because think about it. I mean, I'm at that age where I may retire. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Retirement sounds great. What are you going to do? You can't golf all day. It'd be fun for a week. But then what do you do, right? And, and for my wife and I, we want to serve. And, and we have a plan. And I have a plan that I'm, I'm sticking with. So set those goals. What do you want to accomplish? And uh, what good do you want to do in the world? And set those goals and stay with them. Okay, next. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, get, I would say, <laughs> you know, you take classes on, and I took those classes, and I don't know what they do today, but, you know, on what the resume's like, right? And I've looked at thousands of resumes in my life and hired lots of people. And I would honestly never let a resume go over one page, okay, because it's like, what the heck is this, right? Okay? Unless you're in a scientific thing and you've got all these citations of things. Um, but 
really the resume does not matter as much as the relationships. And, and, and what I would do is tailor a resume for a company and show that you're passionate or you have some interest in this company for some reason, right? Because they just get a lot of resumes. And a resume is just a piece of paper. And it's hard to stand out. If, if you've got a very high GPA, you, you note that, right? But if you're middle of the road and you're struggling, you don't know what to stand out, focus on something that's unique about that company and why you want to be at that company. And hopefully you know someone. Hopefully you know, have some connections because relationships are way more important than a resume. Next question. Every day. I used one on the way here, right? So I should be alert. I mean, you know, when I first started, I didn't. Um, I remember when I first started, I uh, brought a bunch of oils home, set them on my counter. My wife said, what are those? I said, I don't know. It's what we sell, so you better use them and figure out what they are, right? You know? And then I was sitting next to uh, our Dr. Hill doctor uh, in my meetings, and I started to get a little cold sore, right? And uh, I said, do we have anything that works with cold sore, right? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, use, use uh, melaleuca, a little bit of lavender, a little bit of melissa, and then some oregano, right? And so I did that, and I found that I could deal with cold sores um, just as effective as, as taking medication. I wouldn't say it's more effective, but I didn't have to take the medication. For me, I wasn't anti-medicine or anything. It's just like I didn't want to go to the doctor or go to the pharmacy, whatever. I could just use these oils, and, and it was just as effective. Um, but then the problem was, then you think you're an expert, right? So this worked for me. So my daughter had had a C-section, and, and I said, you know, a cold sore, you kind of get a scab. That's kind of like a C-section. So I said, oh, yeah, use, use melaleuca, lavender, a little bit of oregano, right? I don't know if any of you know this, but if you use oregano on a wound like that, she put it on and just started screaming because of the pain, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, wash it off with water. Well, you don't do that either. You wash it off with other, like, mineral oil or olive oil or something. Right? So ah, there's a lot I had to learn. But now, <laughs> now I, use, I use oils every day for something, one thing or another, right? Okay, are we done? We're it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.